Okay, let's just assume that we're finished. And the next step would be to um, prepare this for uh, firing because that's typically what would happen with a wet clay piece. Uh, otherwise, it would shrink and crack off of the armature. So uh, what has to be determined now is how, how do we separate it? There's, there's several ways to do that. One would be to cut it in half and separate it in two pieces. Another way would be to uh, remove the whole top section, take that off, and then go and hollow the center, remove the armature, and then through a process of scoring, uh, after it's been hollowed out, scoring the edges, and then putting that back on, and chasing the seams, and pulling it together. What we're aiming for is to get a uniform thickness of about an inch thick, so that the piece will dry out uh, uniformly with the least amount of warping, and, and, and the shrinking will be, will be uniform as well. So right now, this clay is very wet, so it's a little too early to sever it because these things, uh, if we lay them down, they'll get crushed and, um, and deformed. So what we need to do is let this dry for possibly, depending on the climate, if it's a very dry climate, it would be uh, uh, ready to cut in half in possibly a day. So that it's really pretty firm on the outside and, uh, and at that point, uh, we can then begin to cut it without damaging the surface. So, once it's reassembled and put back together, it's ready for firing. Okay, this head has dried out to uh, the right hardness for separating it. If it's too hard, it'll be too difficult to cut through and give us too much resistance. If it's too soft, um, it, will, it will warp when we're handling the separate pieces. So, you know, judging the hardness is pretty important. And there's a, there's a range. It can be a little either way. Uh, the second thing that we have to think about is going to be where to separate it. There's always, depending on the shape of the head and the thickness of the neck and the amount of uh, rib cage or shoulders involved, these will all affect that decision. Uh, one way to, to separate a head would be to, to actually cut it in half this way so that you would have two pieces. That uh, makes it very easy to, to really get it off of the armature and hollowing them out separately and putting them back together. However, on a female, it's a little bit of a danger because the neck is thin. And so if I were to cut this in half, that neck would maybe only be about that thick. And now with semi-dry clay, we run the danger of having that crack or break. And so we want to avoid that danger. So I think in this case, since We've got a large mass at the top. The safest way to do this would be to separate it along the top of the skull and remove this whole top section, hollow that out, and then go into the neck and hollow that out and come up from underneath. And at some point, we're going to try to remove that armature that we built with the, the wire and the the paper which you're about to see exposed and we need to get rid of that so we can get in there and, and work. So I'm going to begin to perform this procedure and one thing that's kind of important is that you go in at this kind of an angle. You don't want to go in so that the, the wall edges are, are too angular. And I want to make sure that I get all the way through. And it's going to be a little thicker in some places because I've added a lot of clay for this hair. So to get down to the level of the armature, you can usually feel the, the knife hit that. 
And another choice that I make that's important that when you're doing this is that you wouldn't, for example, uh, want to cut through an ear because then you'd have the problem of matching up and re-registering that. It's easier to cut on high points where places where you can re-blend that, that surface easily where it's kind of a random quality anyway rather than cut through a, uh, a part of a face or through the ear or something like that. Yeah, I can feel, I can feel the armature, of the knife there. I'm only going in a few inches. Well, actually, about an inch and a half, where I feel it. And you can do sort of like a sawing motion, so that you really sever all of the clay. And I've made myself a little line here that I'm following. Again, it's going to be kind of thick here in the back. And now I'm going to turn. And I'm doing that purposely for a couple reasons. One, so that it creates a registration. So when I put this back on, after I've removed it, it will have something to, to rest upon. And you can see here I'm really going deep before I hit that armature. Um, going about three or four inches. You can hear the armature. And that's what I want to hear. I want to know that I've gone all the way through. And here I'm going to change directions a little bit. Start to go up. Probably better to do this with not a razor sharp knife, just in case you slip. Play doesn't really need for the knife to be all that sharp. In fact, you could probably use a, a fettling knife, which is a, a pottery knife. It's got a thin blade and a kind of a dull tip on it, something you can't cut yourself with. And I'm almost at the end here. There we go. That actually came loose, so that, that's a good sign. It means I got all the way through. It also means that the hair wasn't connected that well to the scalp, so. There, I'm going to have to go back and reattach that a little bit. And I might go around one more time just to make sure that everything is loose. And I can feel it wiggling. And that's a good thing. And uh, what's kind of nice is I've got this knot to hold on to. So I'm just sort of gradually in a global way, just kind of wiggle that and get it loose of that armature. Sometimes it's a little resistant. Ah, there we go. And you can see 
Our armature is intact, and that shouldn't be too difficult to remove. So now, um, again, this is nice and firm, so it's easy to handle now without uh, destroying it, especially these areas that have got a little thin. And uh, I usually like to put some kind of newspaper or foam or a pillow or something like that down. And now the first thing I'm going to do is remove the, the paper. And I'm going to start to scoop it out. And what I'm looking for is a uniform thickness, this whole cap. And it should be anywhere from uh, half an inch to three quarters. And so something like that. And so I can use either a, a little scooping tool like this. This, this clay is pretty firm. So and I'm going to judge using my fingers as a gauge to make sure that I have that uniform thickness. And I can use this tool also, which makes for a nice scooping tool. All right. So I'm going to just go all the way around and all the way into it and scoop it out and make it a uniform thickness. And the reason for that is twofold. One, that a uniform thickness will dry at about the same rate because of the air, and also it'll be a lot lighter. This is what I'm going to do all the way through this piece and also on that one. And eventually, what we're going to do is score this, but we're not quite ready for that yet. First, we have to get it all uniform thick. Now, we've got the top off, and the next task at hand is to uh, get this armature out of there. So. Uh, I'm going to have to cut around here to loosen it. And so, same problem. I want to have a uniform thickness of this wall. It's going to match the top cap, half an inch to three quarters. So, knowing that, I'm just going to make a little line. And begin to remove... And some of this paper I could probably just take off right away. That'll help give me a little access. That whole ball in the center can go. So this is this one might go easy. I should never say that. I could jinx myself. around and make sure I have clearance on both sides of that T joint. And at that point I might be able to get rid of some more paper. And I want to right now this front loop that went out this way that was very important to hold the weight of this uh, clay now is slightly undercut, so I can't lift that out until I get rid of that undercut of the clay, so I'm going to have to do that. And then everything else should release.
And sometimes it gets a little thin in spots. And in those places where it has gotten thin, I'll have to go back and add some clay to try to again make that a uniform thickness because what will happen is if it's too thin, it will dry very quickly and shrink. And that's the problem because if it shrinks faster than the thick areas, then it could, it could form a little crack. I'm just about free on this side. And I want to rejoin that area in the front there. That little tendril of hair wasn't quite well enough attached, so that's wants to break off. So I'm going to have to be careful of that as I go along. This whole section here it's kind of delicate because I can feel it's only about a, a quarter of an inch thick in some places. So that's a weak area. So I'm going to have to reinforce that as soon as I get this armature out. That's what I was hoping for. And the nice thing is this newspaper is now damp and easy to pull out. Now with a little luck, I can spin this armature and unrotate it on the threads and that will allow me then to lift this out. But, you know, while I have it here and it's still supporting everything, I can use that to my advantage because now I can get into this area and everything's going to be steady. So I'm going to work now because I've got a lot to hollow out in this whole frontal section. So I'm going to be going in this way and removing that clay. And at some point this will get in my way too much and I'll have to get rid of it. But for right now, it's serving a purpose. And I usually judge the thickness just by using my fingers as calipers to see how thick everything is. And again, striving to get everything pretty close to the same thickness. I'm just going to spend a little time removing this area down here. I'm going to go right up to the pipe. Gotten to the pipe. And again, I'm checking my, my thickness. Still a little thick right up in there. And now I think I'm going to remove this. So I'm going lefty loosey. Almost there.
Oh, there we go. Okay. And I'm loose now. And you want to, when you're holding this piece, you want to try to hold it in a broad way because this still is a little bit on the wet side and you want to, don't want to create dents. So you get a place like this that's giving you some resistance. You just take your time. And sometimes you could actually get somebody to help you. Or if you're by yourself in your studio, just have to tough it out. Mm. Success. <laughs> okay, now, now that you have this hollowed out, now you'll be able to really see where you have to go. And again, try to hold this in a nice broad way. And now I can go in and right around where that hole for the pipe was and I'm going to continue to hollow out and get a uniform thickness. This might be a good time to take a break because I'm just going to be doing more of the same. I'm going to continue to hollow this neck out until it's a uniform thickness and then I'm going to swing back up to this part and make that a uniform thickness. And, uh, and after that's done, we're going to score it and put them back together again. Before we join the head, I'm going to make some slip in, in advance. And it's important to know when you're making slip that you have to make it from totally dry clay. And I usually just gather up the, the little pieces that have fallen off and I let them, if they're in small pieces, they'll dry really quickly. And then I just crush them. And the reason that it has to be totally dry, bone dry, is because if the clay is bone dry, it works like a sponge. The water goes right into the center of the clay, just like a dry sponge. But if it's half wet, it won't do that. So that's why you need to have really dry, dry clay. And if I just grind it into smaller pieces, the water will get into it faster, and I won't have to stir it quite so much. Better to make too much than not enough. You can always save it. And use it for the next piece or just let it dry out and Okay, I'm going to add the water now and I'm going to make it to the consistency of heavy cream to yogurt. Roughly a peanut butter consistency right now. Need it to be a little bit thinner.
The slip is a way of, uh, it's almost works like mortar. It's the same, because it's the same material as the clay, the water from the slip leaches into the dried clay where it's been scored, makes that wetter. And so you're going to do that on both sides. And then when you join it, you push it and you just squeeze the excess out. But the, the fact that it has enough water in it that it's going into both opposing edges serves as a kind of an adhesive of the same material. Okay, we're ready. All right, we're, we're ready to start to add the slip. I've just put this top back in place. Uh, it's been hollowed out. And I've added a couple registration marks so that I know exactly where to replace this. So just lift that off for the moment. And you can see this has been hollowed out from the top and from the bottom. I've reattached the, uh, the pipe back onto the flange and of course I've removed the T-section the and this is just going to serve as a support for my hollow head so that it will be in an upright position for me to add the, the top plate. So I'm ready now to start scoring and you can go pretty deep. I'm going to go one way first and then the other. Sort of like a cross hatch. And that will allow the, the moisture of the water to get down below the surface and really into uh, hopefully an eighth to a quarter an inch into the clay. And so I'm just showing you uh, this one section. I'm going to go all the way around the whole, the whole circumference here. But for right now, this is just, this is what I'm going to do on not only this half, but also on the other half. So I'll get it right out there to the edge. And now I'm going to come back and I'm going to score again. So I really get that old clay or existing clay to become part of the new slip. And I'll come back to you after I have this whole thing done. Okay, here we go. And I've joined that. And I'm looking here at my, my registration lines, and they're lining up. So the next thing I want to do is I want to squeeze it. I want to compress it together. So if I can squeeze a little bit from both sides, and I can see that slip squishing out, that's a good sign. And then I'm just push those ends together right up against each other. And now I can begin to just push right across the top, use a little bit of that slip and rejoin the surface. I don't want it to get any wetter than I have to because I don't want it to get too slimy and, and have a smooth finish. So I think I'll take some of the excess slip out. Make sure it's lining up and everything is lining up pretty good. All right, so now that that's been pushed together, now I can just take my tool and try to blend that 
in such a way that you don't see the line anymore and cut through that cut. And if you're worried that it hasn't really joined well, well then you can really, uh, one way to have an extra insurance policy is to just dig in like this, push in. And what I'm doing is on both sides of that seam, I'm really pushing back in and rejoining it and now coming back and just blending it. It's almost like what I was doing with a slip, only this time I'm joining the clay from the top and the bottom together along with the slip that really marries it in a way that it's all one again. And you can really especially do it in areas where uh, it's hair, where you can just generally blend. You don't have to really do any remodeling uh, of a nose or an ear or something like that. Okay, here's our seam, and you can see where that's beginning to squeeze out a little bit. So I'm just going to dig in and pull some of this clay from the top and some from the bottom together to really join it across the seam. What I'm going to do is just continue to blend this uh, all the way around the whole, um, the whole seam. And then I'll come back to you and show you when it's finished. Okay, so I've got this all hollowed out now. And I'm noticing that this is getting a little weak right in through here. So I'm just going to put a prop in place here to help support that, that weight. And... You can see I've pretty much gone around and blended all my seams. Right here there's a little bit that hasn't been done yet, but for the most part I've gotten rid of my registration marks. And what you want to do is look for anything that reveals where that seam might have been. And uh, sometimes it helps to, to try different light sources from different directions. That can reveal something that you didn't see under one light source. But now that that slip has begun to really sink into the clay, it's become more of the same consistency as the original clay. So now when I blend, it feels like all the same kind of clay again, which is exactly what you want. So there, I can just stop at this point and let this continue to dry. Uh, I don't really need to cover it anymore. It will just now, uh, since it's hollow, uh, the air will get into the inside and the outside, and it will dry evenly and shrink evenly. And uh, when, it's, uh, when it's totally dry, uh, it can be fired, and it's forever. This is going to be a session uh, or the segment where I'm going to be talking about the eyes and what the eyes say. And uh, the irony there is that the, the eyes themselves really don't say anything. It's the muscles all around the eyes that arrange themselves in a configuration to express uh, a feeling or, or whatever they're thinking. Uh, that's what makes the eyes say what they say. So um, if, for example, uh, you were going for a very open expression, you just might, the eyes, the, the lids are high. Uh, if you're more concerned, we might be get, begin to, to sort of focus and narrow the brow ridge a little bit. Uh, and that could go in the direction even of a scowl, which would be to really uh, use what we call the, the corrugator in here and it pulls that muscle in and and it narrows the eye down. Now the eye can also be narrowed down by this, what I'll call the embouchure or the, the muscle surrounding the eye, this orbicularis muscle. And what that does is when we laugh, for example, we lift this flesh and, and that crowds the eye socket a bit and it 
lifts the lower lid up and so the window of the eye is much smaller. So all those muscles uh, are the things that, that really create expression. And that would extend to the, uh, the orbicularis oris. Uh, there is the, the corrugator. So you can see just putting a little shadow in through there uh, brings some degree of, of concern or suspicion. Um, it's, not, it's not a happy expression. So it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, innocence, and an openness of expression, that's the last direction you want to go. If you're looking for concern, uh, suspicion, seriousness, then you are going to want to turn up the volume on things like that. And uh, the more that corrugator pulls that, that eyebrow down, it forces the eyebrow down even farther and then oftentimes what happens is it lifts the eyebrow up in that area and you can see now that's changed from a, a rather open expression to much more of a serious and almost angry expression. I think what I'll do also is just put a little iris in here so that add something to the expression. Okay. And as this comes over, it crowds it and it's and if it's happening on both sides, then you're going to get these vertical lines that come from the a bit of the, the frontalis and the procerus, and that, that lifts or lowers. And this orbicularis is going to narrow it. We'll see less of the window of the eye. And this might even come down a little bit. So that's just a few uh, expressions ranging from, from very open to very closed down. and let's say, uh, uh, open expression to a concern one. Okay, so, so as this orbicularis changes and uh, focuses in, contracts a bit, that expression uh, relates to what's going on in another orbicularis, another orbicular muscle, and that's the one that surrounds the, the mouth. And so, that could go from a, a very open expression now to kind of a more determined or, or uh, uh, concerned expression. So now the mouth is going to begin to turn down. The lip may contract a little bit to flatten as it's being pulled back a bit, possibly even the lower lip might begin to come out. I'm just going to, first I'm going to have to just indicate a little bit of the, the features of the mouth. So these are very subtle changes having quite a big impact. Right, and they are related, so Whatever the eyes change, many times the mouth in concert goes along with it. If you, for example, wanted to capture this very determined kind of look, if instead of going in the in the negative and the pejorative, if you went to uh, making it just uh, an intensity, then you know the degree of intensity is going to be controlled by how deep those shadows are. So what the eyes say, pretty much at the same time 
the mouth is going to be reflecting the same kind of attitude. So if it's a very open attitude and we want to lose this intensity, I'll just get rid of that. We'll lift the eyebrow again. We'll take the stiffness out of the mouth. The mouth will now be a little bit fuller because it's not stressed. We'll just lift the corners a little bit on the edge and everything begins to change and go back toward the center as if uh, we were almost at a point where we started a blank page with a totally blank expression and then all of a sudden that expression began to be uh, affected by something, by, by anger or by joy. Uh, and so we're either receptive or we're resisting. And so that's all reflected in the eyes and the mouth pretty much at the same time. Let's think of this as a, uh, just a, a, a blank canvas, so to speak. All the muscles are at rest and uh, suddenly the model, your model, your sitter, uh, or whoever you're working from, uh, has more of a, uh, um, an intensity about them. Uh, so what happens, the muscles that control that intensity are uh, the muscles around the eye, the orbicularis oris, and the muscle around uh, the mouth, same kind of a, a, an oval muscle, and they contract, and as we begin to uh, go in that direction of, of, of concern or intensity, some of these muscles begin to uh, pull the eyes down. For example, one of the very dramatic ones is the corrugator, and that creates this shape in here. And it, you immediately get a sense of concern when you see that, when you see somebody doing that. And when that muscle gets pulled in, it pushes the brow down. And now the brow is coming down, and it's clamping down and it's making this area smaller and it's you can see immediately how that's changing it from an open expression to one of suspicion or concern and while that's happening the mouth doesn't stay at rest it has to reflect the same emotion so now what's going to happen is the lips are going to become a little tighter uh, they're going to be drawn out toward the side of the mouth the mouth is going to begin to turn down a little bit and you're going to be able to see that that connection between these two things in chorus now that are that are uh, coming together to create a, a whole shape the, uh, the 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 eyes themselves don't do anything so um, if we use the expression what do the eyes say it's not really the eyes themselves the eyes just a, a ball uh, underneath the flesh and muscle. It's that flesh and muscle rearranging itself around that ball that really make the statement. When I'm beginning to do uh, a portrait and I'm thinking about um, how, to, how to make it complex, how to make it interesting, how to make it evocative so that the viewer can participate with it a bit, like the Mona Lisa or, or uh, uh, Rembrandt self-portraits or something like that. There's something going on there that you're, you're slightly arrested by and want to know more about because it's not A or B or, or right or wrong or happy or sad. Those are kind of one-speed emotions. But if you begin to put them together, it sort of is one of those deals where one and one make three or four. If you put the right combination together, if you put unhappy with a little bit of a stiff upper, upper lip and a, and a dollop of self-determination, you get a, a, a beginning of something more complex. Or if you take happy and you add a little melancholy to it or a little bit of um, something else, now it's getting richer. And I think those are the things that make up for uh, a complex expression is the combinations of emotions and feelings and 
uh, qualities. For every uh, emotion, you have to kind of look inside yourself and, and try to analyze uh, what these feelings are and understand them, and then try to figure out how to apply them in a physical way. What, what can I do physically to play that up? And there's really not a, a direct answer for that. It's just uh, uh, the closest I could get to it would be to, to try to appreciate it, first of all. Just to recognize it and appreciate it, and then you have a chance of achieving it.